Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. For the Bashful Bunt, now you can privately ask me a question. It's in the description box down below, labeled askme.com forward slash add Phoenix. I will get those messages and reply almost instantly, if not within a couple of hours. If you are new to the channel and enjoy what you are hearing, or you have been here for a while and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snacks, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin, entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. This happened when I was 17. I'm 20 now. I was walking home from a party, and it was pretty late, around 4.30 or 5 a.m., one of my guy friends had decided to walk me home since he didn't want me to walk home alone so late. The streets were empty and it was pitch black. As we are walking and chatting, we notice that a guy is walking up to us. When he approaches, he starts saying over and over again, Hey, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. I promise. He didn't seem threatening and I remember that I didn't feel scared. Maybe because I was with my friend, who is an athletic person. So this guy starts asking us for money to buy a sandwich and tells us that he can't return home until 10 a.m. because his neighbor has a restraining order against him. Apparently the neighbor leaves for work at that hour. At that point, we were both like, what the fuck is going on? We decided to give him some money so he could leave us alone. We gave him around five pence which is more than enough to buy a sandwich. We then lied and told him that's all we had. Then this man looks at me and goes, No, that's not true. You have more money in your wallet. I can see it from here. At that point, I just put my wallet back in my purse and told him I couldn't give him more money. As we were walking away from this man, he once again catches up to us and goes, why don't you guys come with me to try and find a vending machine? And that way, you make sure I'm not spending your money on drugs. I don't exactly remember what we told him, but there was no way we were going anywhere with that dude. Even though I didn't feel scared or threatened at the moment, in hindsight, it was kind of creepy. And I'm just glad my friend insisted on walking me home. Was he just desperate for money? or did he have other questionable intentions? Christmas Eve dinner at Burger King. Sounds innocent enough, right? Not my first choice, but I had to work late, and being Christmas Eve, it looked to be my best choice. I got finished working at 9 and had some coupons for BK, so that made my decision for me. When I got to BK, I noticed it was still open, but the dining room was shut down. The only way I could get something is if I went through the drive through Only problem is, I don't have a car. I tried to walk up to the drive through and place my order, but the compassionate young lady working the drive through wasn't having it. She told me if I didn't have a vehicle, I could not use the drive through I became rather aggravated and began saying things that I'm not proud of. At this moment, an older woman wearing shining armor appeared on the scene, and she offered me to jump in her car and order my food. At first, I turned her down, not wanting to be a bother, but after some convincing, I decided to accept her help. After ordering my food, it took so long to get to it that I missed my bus and got upset. The nice woman offered me a ride home, and I felt kind of 
off put by the offer and declined. She was persistent, but at the time, she seemed nice and convinced me to take her offer. Mind you, I am a 250 pound, 30 something year old man, so I didn't really feel threatened by a 50 something year old woman. If the circumstances were different, I would have not taken the ride. After I told her where I lived, we proceeded home. About five minutes from my house, she made a wrong turn. I explained that I lived the other way and that we needed to turn around or let me out here and I will walk the rest of the way. It was then that the woman's demeanor changed and she told me that she could not let me spend Christmas Eve alone and that she was taking me to her house. I told her that I needed to get home immediately to let my dog out and that I would be fine. The woman then tried to entice me with cocaine and liquor at her place. But since I am in recovery, I told her I wasn't interested. She refused to turn around or let me out and started to drive strangely, not stopping at stop signs. I'm not going to lie. My mind was racing and I began to sweat. I knew that I could physically overpower this woman, but what awaited me at her house? I also felt bad about hurting her after all her kindness, but, but I had to get away before her house, and I didn't know where that was, and I also didn't know how much time I had. Then, all of a sudden, luckily, the car in front was stopped at a stop sign, and crossing it, another was stopped too. She had to slow down to almost a full stop at this point, and this is where I made my break. I jumped out of the car. I jumped out of the car while I was still moving, my food in the car, and I took off running. As I was running away, she stopped and got out of the car and began to try to talk to me into getting back in the car with her. That wasn't just an option. I don't know what her motives were or who in the hell she is, but I knew I wasn't willing to risk my life over it. I ran all the way home and made sure I wasn't followed. What would have happened to me if it was two years earlier and I was still doing drugs and drinking? Her offer of cocaine and booze would have probably worked. Kidnapping, murder, sex trafficking, organ trade, or I don't know. Being a man, the thought of the vulnerability most women face every day was so foreign to me and now I understand the fear most women face. I really feel this nice woman had a nefarious purpose and that I just so happened to be the perfect victim of opportunity. Mind my races, wouldn't the ruse of such a non-threatening bait just be perfect to lower the guard of a prospective victim? Any thoughts would be appreciated. I never went to the cops because I felt they might not believe me or they might look down on me for being scared. Should I place a police report? What if by me not operating this, that someone else ends up getting hurt? Or am I just jumping to the gun and conclusions? All right, I've always been scared to share this story, but I believe it's been long enough so, here is my creepy encounter story. I was 10 years old, I'm a female by the way, and my friend lived in the next street over. Let's call her Shannon. We did what 10 year olds do when alone, walk to the park and the local shop. This one day, we were on the corner of my childhood home's street, and there was a disheveled looking older man with a white beard and long coat walking a long-haired Labrador-looking dog. He called us over and asked if we wanted to play with his dog. Being 10 years old and naive for my age, my parents never really had that stranger danger talk with me. We gladly agreed and started fussing the dog. I remember how dirty the dog felt, leaving residue on my hands, and the poor dog smelt really badly. The man asked if he could take pictures of us stroking his dog. I didn't answer, but Shannon agreed. After a couple minutes, I looked up to see him putting something in his coat pocket. 
I'm not sure if it was a camera or a phone, but it being 2010, camera phones didn't have the best quality. He then mentioned his dog had just had puppies and offered for us to come back to his house to play with them. Shannon was up for it and begged me to say yes, but I refused. Not because I thought it was sketchy, but, but because I wanted to wash the residue from the dog off my hands. He must have lived local because we would see him often with his dog and ask us for more pictures. This continued for a couple of months, and I was just starting high school. After that, I never saw him again. A couple years later, I came across a news article from my local area where I grew up. A man that looked exactly like the one we encountered was on trial for multiple counts of child abuse and possession of child sexual assault images. I sent it to my old school friend, and she agreed that it was him. I often wonder why that man took those pictures of us, where they ended up, and what would have happened if we went to his house to see these supposed puppies. So, I'm walking the trail in my local park, as I had done every other day that week when a man starts walking next to me. I'm a little startled because I had my headphones in. Stupid, I know. But I took them out and said good morning. Maybe I shouldn't have done that, but everyone in that park greets each other. While in Rome, right? Mm, I don't know. Anyway, he asks how I am, and I say fine, then silence. A normal human interaction. Then, after about 10 seconds of silence and him walking next to me, which feels intentional at this point, he starts asking more questions. My alarm bells are now at one. So, do you come here often? And sometimes it's, it's a nice walk. Do you live nearby? Alarm bell is at number two now. Nah, not too close. Like... Am I supposed to answer that truthfully? Oh, okay. You live alone then. Alarm bell number five. Oh, no, 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 no. I got way too many people in my house. Thankfully true, but again, how does he want me to answer that? Ah, so anything like bad or crazy ever happened here? Oh, okay. So I'm going to die right now. Okay. Uh, uh, oh no, they they keep a really good, really good eye on this place. Thank you, brain. Good girl. Oh my god. Yeah? Cool. Then he asks if he can give me a massage sometime. Claims it's a side business. I somehow managed to give him a good no. Again, thank you, brain. Then he mutters something about having to get back to the door dashing. You went for a walk in the park while on break from door dashing? Okay. Then turns around and walks back to the entrance. I turn around a moment later and he is gone. I called my dad, my cousin, my bestie. Let them all know where I was, what I was wearing, what he looked like, etc. Thankfully, I got home and haven't had any anything happened like that since. I live really close to that park and I was scared shitless for a week after this occurrence. Not gonna lie, I'm here purely for validation. I'm not crazy, right? Like, that's straight up creepy, right? Like, I wanna believe this dude was just trying to shoot a shot and left once he knew he failed, but like, bro, could not be any creepier right? Either way, I haven't been back to the park since, which is fucking stupid. I want to walk in my own neighborhood, damn it. I hate people sometimes, but is the hate justified? Ugh, I don't know. What do you think? This one is a story that followed my story about the neighbor man stalking me. 
It's not an update. Just a phone stalker after we live through hell caused by that fruit loop of a fool. This super happy fun time experience takes place about four years ago after the neighbor ordeal. I guess my ever so endearing demeanor attracts unhinged fools. Anyways, I start working for a new job just after Christmas. The company I work for took over an account at a building closer to my home. So I transferred to the newly acquired location. After my first week there, some of the people began to ask about my relationship status and take interest in me. This little ray of sunshine happened to be single back then, but I was not ready to mingle. I was focused on work, my family, and school. I was only there for about three months and didn't end up liking the new location, so I left for a better suited job. Imagine my shock when some of the co-workers wished me an early happy birthday and luck at name of new job. In a completely clown shit move, the manager had disclosed where I would be working. As I'm leaving, I see something I'd never noticed before. A phone list of employees with first and last names printed in the break room. One of many what in the actual fuck moments to come. I let the manager know he needed to remove me from that as I no longer work there and two, would not be okay with that even if I continued to be an employee there. He shrugged it off with the attitude of someone who assumes an upset woman is having her time of the month, rolled his eyes and took it down. I was beyond thrilled to start my new job when the calls started. Looking back, there had been maybe three prior to what I believe was the beginning of all of this but they weren't as persistent, so I didn't link them together. Side note, I have a tendency to bleach every red flag white, so please trust your instincts and scary movie, run, bitch, run, yourself away when red flags are presented. I began to receive phone calls from a blocked number every week, only Friday through Sunday, but with holidays, yay and always between 1 to 4 a.m. I have a weird thing about my phone being near me and left on at night ever since my sister's accident. When she had said accident and they tried to call me about her, my phone was often in the living room. For everyone who wants to ask why I didn't just shut it off or put it away, this is why. I will virtually throat punch anyone who says anything like, just shut your phone off in the comments. I'm an insomniac and a light sleeper, so the calls always woke me up. I tried answering them without saying more than a hello, but always just heard breathing. This had gone on for three weeks when my birthday came. Worked a new job, then the rebel that I am went and got a red box to take and have a pizza and movie night with my parents to celebrate. As I'm scrolling through the ridiculous, dull selection of red box titles, my phone rings. One of the girls from my new job tells me that a guy who identified himself as my boyfriend had come in and dropped off a pizza, flowers, and card for my birthday. Confused, I relay to her I didn't have a boyfriend. She nervously laughs and says that she found it strange my boyfriend wouldn't know if I was off work and that he would need to leave the stuff there rather than give it to me in person. I thanked her, got my movie, and didn't give it too much thought. It was my birthday, so that was a problem for tomorrow, me. Next day, I open the card at work and its tickets, photocopy, not the actual ones I could have used, to a place four hours away. In the card, there was a lengthy poem and details of the trip, complete with dates and hotel name, the person planned to take us on. Creep factor raised. No idea who this is from. When I asked the co-workers, they could only give a generic description. The weekend comes, and like clockwork, the calls come in. I decide not to answer, and now just decline the call. Life goes on. My mystery night and shining potential restraining orders never came back to work, and the calls continue. 
These calls went on for three years. I'll save you two significant life bets. But I have changed jobs and moved in those years. The calls did not stop until winter of last year. I tried answering and asking who it was. I tried screaming and cussing them out. I tried having my friend answer. I tried having males answer and threaten. Basically, I tried more than Sam I Am tried to get you to eat green eggs and ham. A few times, they would have a song quad up to play when I answered. The more it went on, the more emboldened they got. They started heavy breathing. Picture a cross between masked Jason from Friday the 13th and a first-time masturbator. And then whispering my name. At one point, they ended up graphically describing what they dreamed of doing to me. I called the cops, who said without an actual threat, they can't do anything. Dreams don't count as a threat, I guess, is what I was told. I called the phone company to see if they can tell me the number of the caller. Who told me they can't disclose that and to call the cops? I ended that phone call with a cheery... When you see someone wearing my skin as a suit on the news, remember this. Have a great fucking day. I am now debating on changing my phone number. Personal legit reasons why I hadn't done this before. But also seriously concerned for who the fuck is doing this to me. For someone to be committed to calling you every weekend of their life for that long, that is extremely frightening. One morning at around two unknown missed calls, I wake up to a text from an unknown number. I'm greeted with an unsolicited dick pic. Fun fact, nobody wants an unsolicited dick pic, folks. I responded saying if whoever it was ever contact me again, their photo and phone number would be placed on Craigslist, Men Seeking Men, so they could get their own share of dick pics. I reverse searched the number, and lo and behold, got a name of someone who I briefly worked with at the beginning of the story. It all starts to click that the call started once I began that job. This guy would have known where my job was and about my birthday, since the co-workers I had working there wished me an early happy birthday on my last day. Him sending that pic solidified that he was the caller. That's all, folks. Anticlimactic ending never saw or heard from him again, thankfully. So, weird ex-co-worker and now the strange man that keeps ringing my phone. I hope I never, ever hear from you again. Here's an encounter with a killer on the bus. This seems like the right place to tell this story, and it happened back in 2013. It was about 8 or 9 o'clock, and I was on my way home from a pal's house. I was set upstairs on the back of the bus. There was only me and one other person on the top floor of a bus, and he was set near the front on the opposite side. When I got up to go get off of the bus and walk down from the back towards the stairs, he called me. I don't remember exactly how he asked, but he was asking for a lighter. I walked up to him, going through my pockets, and told him I had matches and handed them to him. He took them from me and just stared at them for a few good seconds and then handed them back to me and said something along the line of, Don't worry about it. The time it took him to decide not to use them felt very strange and the eye contact before and after just felt intense. I got walked down the stairs thinking, what the fuck is up with that? And I got off the bus. I told a couple people how weird it felt and described what he was wearing, a zip-up black hoodie with a knockoff Hardy-style tiger on the chest. Fast forward about a week, and there's a fatal stabbing on a bus in my city. A young girl on her way to school was stabbed to death on the top deck of a bus. Stabbings are pretty common in my city, but a young girl being killed on her way to school, that's big news anywhere. They show a photo of the suspect being arrested, but 
you can only see the back of his hoodie. Straight away, I think that's the exact same Ed Hardy knockoff and start wondering if it's the guy I had seen. When they released more photos of him from the front, I knew it was him for sure. The scary thing is, it transpired he had recently been let out of a mental health facility. He hadn't been given any support and had been sleeping rough on buses. I've had many interactions with mentally ill people and dangerous individuals, but this is one that stays with me. Even though the interaction was a bit much, it felt so strange. I always wonder if he was seeing how I reacted when he asked me hence why he didn't use the matches. Who knew it's just a sad story, really? Rest in peace to the poor girl who was murdered. Her name was Christina Atkins. She was 16 years old. This story happened three years ago, around the time that COVID started, so it was a while back, but still worthy of a post. It was 2020, and I had just gotten a new job in a small town near my area. While looking for a place to live, my sister offered to rent her house to me. She had bought the house two years prior, but she and her husband didn't really take to it, and their commute to work was so long that they had to move out. So the house was uninhabited. Luckily for me, it was actually pretty close to my work, around a 40 minute drive. And my sister pretty much rented it for free to me. I just paid for the water and electricity and looked after the house. I was living there for a solid two or three months and had already begun getting used to it. One night after coming back home from work and parking my car as I walked towards my door, I noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb to my house. I leaned down and picked it up thinking that it might have been mine since I'm a smoker. But after looking at the brand name, I realized that it wasn't mine and threw it away. I didn't think much of it and shrugged it off as some asshole throwing it on my curb. I went on with my night and nothing unusual happened. Two days later, I was once again walking to my house when I spotted a few more cigarette butts, this time near my porch. Needless to say, I was pissed off and thought that someone sat on my porch and smoked, but since I didn't know who it was, there was nothing I could do about it. I noticed that they were put out pretty recently, so whoever it was probably walked off as I was approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop, and it was pretty late, past 1 a.m. So I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. It's a suburban neighborhood, and it was COVID, so people rarely ventured out at night, but I didn't think much of it. Around half an hour later, I was surprised when I heard chattering nearby. I listened intently, but I couldn't hear what they were talking about as their voices seemed almost muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly got off my couch and walked to the front door to make sure that it was locked. As I was approaching the door, I froze mid-step as I heard the two approaching my porch and reducing their talking to a whisper. I realized right away that whoever this was wanted to break in. I leaned against my front door and waited, expecting a loud bang against the door, or the doorknob being shaken, but it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to my window to see if they had walked away or changed their mind. My windows have bars from the inside out that you have to unlock so that you can move the curtains or look out the window comfortably. I slowly unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtains and was taken aback. Leaning up against my window was a man. He was as startled as I was because he basically stuttered over his own steps as he jumped back. He tightened his hoodie to cover his face, so all I could really see was his big blue eyes looking at me. His friend realized what was going on and right away started to kick the door in. 
He kicked it a solid four or five times, but the door wouldn't budge. All the while, I was staring at them, frozen in fear and trying to comprehend the situation. I snapped out of it and slammed the bars over my window, locking them, and running upstairs to the storage room where I pushed the table up to the door and called the cops. As I listened and expected the two to come inside any minute, I heard a loud crash and the bars from the windows being shaken aggressively. When they realized that they could not get in, one of them let out a long, angry scream that probably woke up half the neighborhood. By the time the cops came, they were long gone. The police couldn't find out who it was, but were more active in the neighborhood in the following weeks. Regardless, I wasn't too keen on staying there so shortly after I moved out. My sister sold the house a few months later, and as far as I know, nothing similar ever happened since. When I was just 16 years old, I was in a choir at my high school that performed for a lot of different events around town. One of them was to sing at the middle school's sporting events. The middle school in my town, there is only one, is just about a half a mile from my childhood home. So whenever we had events there, I walked. Didn't get my license until I was 17. This one night, I think it was in November, we had to sing at a basketball game, and it was obviously dark when I was able to leave. Normally, I wasn't allowed to walk alone at night, but for choir, I was given permission unless I felt unsafe. But there wasn't any reason to be creeped out at first, so I started my walk. Just down from the middle school is a stretch of road with almost no street lights that has always creeped me out when I'm walking. I crossed quickly and had a fast pace going, as I'm a naturally paranoid person. About two minutes into the dark zone, I heard rapid footsteps behind me. I at first figured it was a jogger, but they made no attempt to pass me, and just stayed a comfortable, for them, ten-foot distance away. They began whistling a jaunty tune, which at first I thought was fun. At this point, I wasn't super scared, perhaps because of the happy whistling tune, but I noticed the footsteps began to speed up. There were no cars on the road, and given the lack of light, when I turned around, all I could see was a silhouette shrouded in darkness. At that realization, I quickened my pace to barely under a run. The whistling continued, getting more breathless as this person began to run after me. I looked back to see a dark figure coming at me full speed and, in terror, began to run frantically as well. I will never forget those last moments running through the dark subdivision, hearing his whistling and footsteps getting closer and closer. This person followed me up to my door. I ran inside and locked the front, checked all the other doors, and went upstairs to my bedroom. From the window, I could still see a silhouette and I could still hear him whistling. I slept with my knife under my pillow that night. I have so many creepy encounters and I'm kind of loving sharing them because reading everyone else's has been very eye-opening for me, as well as vindicating of my paranoia. I, a 31-year-old female, up until a couple of months ago with my ex, who's also 31, we weren't doing well in so many ways, and I'd recently gotten a job at a liquor store. We had a lot of regular customers who I knew to be pretty high degree by sight and name after only about two weeks. There was this one man about my height, maybe late 40s, early 50s, that came in and kind of seemed like he was trying to flirt with me. But given at the moment I'm on the chubby side and didn't find myself particularly attractive, I wrote it off. This one day I'm sitting on my lunch and on my way to my car when he pops out of nowhere in the parking lot. He tells me he's noticed me for a while. I'm so beautiful and kind 
and he really wants to take me to dinner. I tell him I'm sorry. I'm in a relationship. He says that's fine, just as friends, because he really wants to know me. He hands me his card, which is just his name, number, and email. And I leave, thinking that's the end of it. Q two weeks later, he shows up again, this time waiting for me to be in charge of his transaction. And he places yet another business card, the exact same one, actually, on the counter and insists I call him. Honestly, red flags were on fire at this point, and I started having a large male co-worker walk me to my car. I saw this man several times after, lurking around the bushes by the parking lot, hanging around my car, etc. I ended up telling my boss and the owners about him, too. I quit not too long after. Different reasons. Broke up with my boyfriend and moved back to my hometown. Honestly, though, this guy trying so hard to get me alone made me scared. I already carried pepper spray, but also started carrying a knife again and practicing opening it and getting it into position. Still have this man's card photographed in my cell data and told several friends as he really creeped me out and definitely didn't understand social cues at all. Like the most obvious one, no. For the story, I was 15 when this started. I've alluded to it in comments on this sub, so I thought I'd share the full story since I can't sleep and I'm an oversharing type of person anyway. It started when I went to a movie at the Indie Theater in my hometown. We had two when I was growing up, both owned by the same people, but one theater featured major films and blockbusters. The other did the film festival, well-known kind of everywhere, and more indie movies. My French teacher gave an extra credit assignment to see Man on Wire, I think it was called. So I went with a friend to see it, though she wasn't in the class. When we went to the front, there was a very cute older guy that I'd recognized as the girl in our class's older brother. I think he was 22, maybe 23 at the time. He complimented me and offered to comp our tickets and gave me free popcorn and candy and whatnot, ignoring my much prettier friend. It felt good to be noticed, so I accepted, obviously, and we enjoyed the free movie day. For a little backstory, again, the girl who was his younger sister, in my grade, used to be a friend of mine, and I'd met him many times as a kid, but he was enough older that I don't think he'd recognize me at first, and at that age, I looked more like 19 or 20. The next couple of weeks, I saw him everywhere. Grocery store? Check. Outside my school? Check. Walking home from Safeway? Check. Everywhere. But being 15 and him being cute and older, my dumbass thought it was flattering. So I went to the theater again and was with a different friend. Same thing. He gave me free tickets, popcorn, etc. This friend already knew it had happened before because it was a major subject that I had a hot older man interested in me. We were so young and thought it was so great. He came into the theater during the movie to bring me an extra candy and his number on the back of a receipt. I thought it was so cute. He continued to show up everywhere over the next few months. At this point, I was halfway through 16. And I was at the same movie theater with the same friend I was with the first time. He once again complimented me, saying I was beautiful, asking if I had a boyfriend, if I liked to party. I said yes. He invited me to his house for a party he was having. His address was very close to the house my friend I was with lived in, so I said yes knowing that if I had a sleepover with her, we could go and I would get to go to my first real party. I wasn't allowed out late, nor was I allowed to go to parties. If I'd ever been invited to a high school party. So it was perfect. We went late so we wouldn't seem lame. And as we walked up, 
we could see through the front lit windows to where he was. It was an hour past, and it was just him with several bottles of booze. We looked at each other and decided to walk back to her house. I still saw him a lot after, almost everywhere, until I graduated high school and moved up north for college. I didn't go to that theater ever again until about a year ago. I really want to see other people's reaction to this interaction I had with a guy from Bumble. I matched with this guy and we started talking via text and phone for about two weeks before meeting. We got along really well based on texting and phone calls. Finally, we went on an in-person date. We went to a brewery by his house. It was great at first and the conversation came easy. Then he invited me back to his place to watch a movie, as it was fairly close. One thing of note, I had told him previously I did not want to have sex on the first date, just to avoid that exception. So I expected to literally watch a movie. When we got to his place, he was immediately touchy and affectionate. I gave him a kiss and we made out for a second before he told me to go to his room. I really regret not speaking up for myself and saying no. It was just an awkward situation for me, so I just went. This is when it gets super weird. During the sex, he was so cringe saying things like, who's my princess? And who's mm -mm, is this? Like, not yours, dude. I don't know you. He then was saying it was so good he wasn't going to let me leave then said it multiple times. He then proceeded to say he was keeping my underwear. I said no, and he insisted he was, and that there was nothing I could do about it. I literally just wanted to fucking leave. I felt so weird and unsafe and just gross. I told him I was taking my underwear back, and I did. He remained naked for a while, and I got dressed. I told him I needed to go. He also got dressed, and then I left. Does anyone else think he was absolutely weird and creepy? Oh yeah, I forgot to say it. We don't speak anymore. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to be very close friends with this girl, Kay. Kay and I met in middle school and we instantly clicked. We would hang out after school very frequently. Kay had a very turbulent childhood. Deceased father, foster care, substance abuse mom, eat the works. And Kay's family would house hop a lot. Our sophomore year, Kay's family was staying with their step-aunt ex-husband. My parents never really stressed about me hanging out with Kay because she was such a kind soul and a great influence on me. Now, the man Kay was staying with, I'll call him R, was interesting to say the least. I remember the first incident that made me scratch my head, and it was when we all went out to dinner with Kay and her family, and R tagged along. Kay and I were sat at the table with him, and he was venting to us. I was 15, she was 16, by the way, about his dating life and showing us pictures of his Tinder bio and all the women he was chatting to. We both kind of laughed it off and engaged with him, not thinking much of it. Sometimes when Kay and I hung out, R would have us come to the basement, and he had this room with a drum kit, and he'd play them for us with the lights off. Anyways, the strangest encounter I personally had with him was when I went to Kay's house to hang out for the day, and she went to take a shower. While she was in the shower, I was sitting in her room, and R wandered in and told me he wanted to show me something cool in his room. Kay's room was on the first floor, and R's room was the only room on the second floor. Being the naive girl that I was, I agreed and followed him up the stairs. When we got to his room, he realized it was locked and seemed very annoyed and jittery because his keys were downstairs. 
Now, instead of going downstairs, R takes a credit card out of his wallet and tries to unlock the door that way. Thankfully, it didn't work, and something clicked in my brain, and I decided to go back downstairs and sit in the bathroom with Kay until she was done with her shower. I'm now 23, and looking back at it, I honestly don't think there was anything cool to show me in that room, and I thank the moon and stars that he never got it unlocked. I never told Kay, but as we got older, I casually asked her if she had a weird encounters with him, and she said no. I'm not really sure how to end this, but I'm thankful I never got to see what was beyond that door. Fifteen or so years ago, I switched cities for work, and to ease the tension, I stayed with my sister for a while since she had room after her adult children moved out. She lived in a very nice, very suburban neighborhood. I was still a smoker, but trying to cut back. I never smoked inside, and was trying to keep it about a half a pack a day. I'd go out on the porch, smoke half a cigarette, knock the cherry off, and save the other half for later. The front porch had a wooden swing that was mostly obscured from view of the road by a support column and various shrubbery. Since we had a number of smokers in our family, my non-smoking sister kept an ashtray on the front porch that sat under the wooden swing. It was one of those old school 50s style tempered glass ashtrays that had to weigh a good five pounds and could be used as a deadly weapon if you put your mind to it. My room was at the front of the house next to the front door with windows that overlooked the porch. Not that I could see the porch through the curtains, though my cat would occasionally jump up there to watch me smoke when I went out. One night, I headed out to finish a cigarette. I had started an hour earlier and was shocked to find the ashtray completely empty. Even though I don't remember her going out the front door, I assume my sister had emptied it. She can get icky about things, if you know what I mean, and that's if the mood strikes her. And getting a bit bent over a slightly full ashtray was well within her character. Since my half was gone, I had to head back inside to get another cigarette. I stopped and asked her, if you empty my ashtray, please don't throw my half cigarettes away. What? I didn't empty the ashtray. I gave her a slight fry, not sure side glance. She had no reason to lie, and I didn't hear her go outside. But well, one of us had to have emptied it. I checked the outside trash. Maybe I was running on autopilot and emptied it myself without thinking. No sign of cigarette butts on top of the bags of trash, so it wasn't me. Weird, but I let it go. Flashback nearly a month before, my sister took nightly walks for exercise, and once in a blue moon, she'd run across a stray or escape dog. If she could, she'd catch it to make sure it didn't get hit by a car and reunite it with its owner. I was there when a woman was in absolute tears getting her lap dog back after it ran away through a hole in the back fence. It was so sweet. One night, my sister finds a beautiful rust-colored pit bull. Don't remember the details, but this time the dog was handed over to a woman that lived in the same subdivision who fostered animals. She was supposed to track down the pit owners for us. After a few weeks, no owner had been found, and my sister learned the pit was being kenneled. And by kenneled, I mean kept in a small cage. She offered to adopt the pit, and we went over to retrieve him. Now, I don't want to step on any animal lover's toes, so let me just say, the lady was a wonderful woman doing the Lord's work. But I'll also say that she was probably just a few years off from wandering around the neighborhood, speaking gibberish with pets in her pockets and lobbing cats at random strangers. The woman's house was like crossing a crack house with an animal shelter. The carpet had all been pulled up, exposing concrete floors. Stacks of plastic crates holding animal food of all types 
lined the hallways, and the rooms were full of cages. As soon as the door was open, the smell of dozens of animals hit your nose, and the cacophony of barks, meows, and squawks assaulted the ears. The rooms were full of cages of various animals, and a pack of small dogs immediately came nipping at my ankles. The sound of, just how many animals do you have, was at least a few dozen. My mind couldn't even take it all in, but I'm sure she had at least 20 to 30 cats and dogs, and God only knows what else, either, packed in those cages or scampering them around freely. I'm sure if you looked hard enough and around enough, you probably find a few various rodents as well. We found the pet miserable in a small cage and took him home, and everyone lived happily ever after. I'm just kidding. For no sane reason, apparently the crazy dog lady, as we'd start calling her, decided she wanted the pit back. My sister refused. She'd adopted him, and he was better off with her than being crammed in a cage like he was at this crazy dog lady's place. I did not know this at the time my cigarette butts went missing. I wasn't informed of this until a few days later when I told my sister, Crazy Dog Lady has walked past the house every time I've been out smoking. Uh, yeah, she wants the pit back. I only smoke once every hour, and I saw her at least three times. No telling how many times she walked by in between my smokes. Now... I have no proof or concrete evidence that crazy dog lady was responsible for what happened next, but all signs still point towards her. Within a week of my used cigarette butts disappearing, and possibly the same day that I saw her stalking our house, something strange happened. My sister would normally go to bed at around 11 or 12 at the least. I was working nights at the time, so I usually didn't go to bed until closer to two or three. Well, after my sister went to bed, I go out to get my last cigarette for the night in, and the whole ashtray is gone. A five-pound giant glass ashtray that probably had at least 15 or 20 cigarette butts in it, just gone. I have absolutely no proof, but I strongly suspect she came up on the patio, paced back and forth for a while, nervously, trying to screw up the courage to knock and demand the dog back before abandoning the idea and, for whatever crazy reason, taking the ashtray instead. My sister was asleep, so she didn't do it. I didn't do it. Tray, ashes, and butts, all gone. Even if it wasn't the crazy dog lady, who the hell does that? Who wants or needs an ashtray full of cigarette butts? Hell, even if they just really wanted a heavy ashtray for some reason, why take the butt? There was no sign of them flung into our yard or even on the road. Again, no proof, but that also led me to believe whoever took the ashtray also took the used butt sometime in the week prior. That's even crazier. Did they bring a bag, use their shirt as a makeshift sling to carry the butts away, stuff their pockets full? Hands down, one of the weirdest, most random and flat out pointless experiences of my life. But it also creeped me the hell out. Just the thought that this action happened at one point after I closed the door. I have no idea if someone was watching and waiting in a hiding place and walked up after I went in earlier. Even with my window facing out that way, someone stood on that porch, just feet from me, late at night, and I was oblivious to when it was happening. Someone can be right outside your window or door, and you will never even know it. So I just popped to the bakery to get some lunch. I live on the main street and it's two minutes away. As soon as I'm halfway down the street, I spot these two guys sat on a bench together outside the bakery. 
both looking shady as fuck, and I've never seen them. It's a small town. Everyone knows everyone. One of them is staring at me from the corner of his eye the whole time I'm walking down the street. It felt weird, and I went into the bakery. They didn't have what I wanted, but there's another branch around the corner. So I walked over, and as I come out of the bakery to cross the road, the two guys are now with a woman on the other side. As I cross, the woman shouts, Oi, excuse me, to me, but I ignore her and cross the road. As I'm walking to the other bakery, I notice they're behind me. So I go into the bakery, and they stand outside waiting, but not looking in. I felt like this confirmed that they had picked me out for some reason. I took longer than needed, and eventually they started walking off. I left the bakery and walked in the other direction home. I didn't see them again. But they must have spotted me and then given up or something. What was their intention, do you think? I live in a small Cornish town in the UK full of mostly elderly people. These guys were not from my town, I'm certain. What do you think? A few years ago, I was walking home from Walmart. There's a bus stop right next to the parking lot that I always pass by. As I passed by it, a middle-aged looking man was standing there and I had never seen him before in my life. He suddenly stopped me and asked me, Hey, were you the one who was just in there saying all those terrible things about me? I just froze for a second before stammering out, uh, uh, no sir, that wasn't me. He looked at me contemplatively before replying, all right, I'm going to believe you because I love you. He then asked me, you're not a radical right. I wasn't even sure exactly what he meant, but I assured him that I was not that, in fact, a radical. He seemed to believe me about this too and began confiding in me about members of government that he believes to be radicals. It devolved into a word salad of conspiracy theories, and I'm pretty sure aliens were brought up at one point. I just stood there staring blankly at him as this went on for what felt like several minutes before I could get a word in. When I finally did get the chance to speak up, I just said as nicely as I could, I really need to be getting home, sir. You have a nice day and take care, okay? He then requested a hug before I left and initiated it before I could turn it down. Thankfully, it was a relatively normal hug, as in he didn't try to touch badly, and it was brief. After that, I continued on my way home and looked over my shoulder until I was out of the general area to make sure he didn't try to follow me. He did not, luckily. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. I'd like to give a very special thank you to the reformed members of the channel. Inner Scare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Tina Mead, Seven, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.